I should try and say bon dia. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Sylvia Polo. I am the Dean for Graduate Legal Studies at Columbia Law School. Uh, Graduate Legal Studies includes our LLM program. And it is really a pleasure for me to welcome all of you to Columbia, as well as to the 2017 Br uh, CLS Brazil Forum, which we hope will be the first of an annual tradition to bring together, to bring to Columbia, a group of scholars, uh, members of the judiciary, business people, and lawyers to discuss relevant topics um, of the relationship between the US and Brazil and the Brazilian economy. Uh, so hopefully we are starting something wonderful today. You know, to put together an event like this um, really requires a really strong team. And so there are a lot of people to thank for, for the success of getting here today. I am not going to name names because when I start that, I will surely get myself in trouble. Uh, but I want to, of course, thank um, all of our speakers, uh, the Many of you in the audience uh, participated in uh, making today a reality, your employers, your colleagues, there are many people at the law school, uh, but of course the, the bulk of the credit goes to the students, uh, especially the executive board of the organization who thought of doing this and really pushed to get it done. So congratulations to all of you. <clears throat> I uh, will never miss an opportunity to brag about the LLM program, so I am going to do that for just a minute or two. Um, the LLM program at Columbia really is fundamental to the mission of the law school. We have approximately 300 LLMs who earned their first law degree and started their legal careers in over 50 jurisdictions. And they come to Columbia with their very varied experiences, points of view, um, <clears throat> ways to approach legal problems, and, and enrich the classroom discussion. Uh, we always talk about what a how wonderful it is for LLMs to have the opportunity to spend a year at Columbia, but it really is a privilege for the rest of us to have them here because they really do impact our education um, by sharing their experiences. But as today, uh, evidenced by today, they also enrich learning spaces outside of the classroom by bringing their um, experiences to us uh, in, in events like this. So I hope that those of you who have not had the opportunity to meet many of our LLMs will, will have that opportunity uh, to do so today. Okay, uh, enough about me. Uh, no, uh, it is absolutely an honor for me to introduce our keynote speaker who is one of Brazil's foremost constitutional law scholars. And he is, of course, Ministro Luis Roberto Barroso, or as we would call him here, Justice Barroso. Um, and I am going to introduce him through the lens that, uh, through which I work every day, which is that of an academic and a uh, professional advisor to young uh, lawyers or lawyers who are at the start of their career. And Justice Barroso and his career are truly a model for our students, for he embodies everything that we wish for for our students, which is an absolutely multifaceted uh, career. Uh, Justice Barroso, of course, was a very successful law student, having earned his first law degree and his PhD in law from the State University of Rio de Janeiro. I had thought I would challenge myself to say the name in Portuguese, but I will not do that. Um, he earned um, his LLM from Yale Law School and spent some time at Harvard as a visiting scholar. He, of course, has had a very successful private practice. Uh, immediately after his LLM, he spent some time with Arnold and Porter in the U.S. as a foreign associate and had a very successful career at his uh, firm called Luis Roberto Barroso and Asociados in Rio de Janeiro, where he specialized in public law and uh, litigated many cases before the Supreme uh, Court. He has been a very successful law professor, not only in, um, in Brazil in his alma mater, but also uh, in universities throughout the world where he has guest lectured. And of course, he continues to be a highly regarded public servant. He served as state attorney for Rio de Janeiro from 1985 to 2013 when he was nominated and confirmed for the uh, Brazilian Supreme Federal Court. This is what we tell our students all the time. While they are in law school, they should be preparing for a long and varied career where they can serve in many different um, practices of life. I tend to use uh, President Barack Obama as an example of somebody whose career um, has had different facets, and I am thrilled that I now have a second model uh, to use for my students, so thank you very much. Um, last night, I decided to set aside some time uh, to read up on a recent decision of the uh, Brazilian Supreme Court 
and I prepared myself to read a little bit about Brazilian constitutional law. I am not a, a Portuguese speaker, but I speak Spanish, so I thought I'd be able to do it, and perhaps have to read a little bit uh, about car wash. <clears throat> and so you will understand how thrilled I was when the first decision or the first headline that popped up was the following. Court names Sport Recife as 1987 Brazil title winner, winner over Flamengo. Um, <laughs> I read the article, did not have to read the rules, and I said, of course, in part to be silly, uh, but to remind us that while, of course, the, the court is dealing with some very important matters uh, related to constitutional law, car wash, and some of the other challenges that uh, Brazil is facing right now, it also deals with very much everyday matters uh, for people, and I'm sure that this one in particular is of great importance to a number of, of Brazilians. I am uh, thrilled uh, to welcome uh, Judge uh, Justice Barroso, who will share with us some thoughts about some of the necessary uh, uh, changes that we're going to have to see in Brazil to prepare Brazil to, to take on the mantle of, of leader in South America and, and throughout the world. So Justice Barroso, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you for being with us. everyone. Uh, dear Dean Silvia Polo, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled by this uh, introduction. Uh, I I'm, almost didn't recognize myself in her generous uh, introduction and I want to thank you for welcoming us here and more than that I, I want to thank you for the good that a program like this one that's ran by Columbia Law School does for Brazilian students that come here and especially when they go back better prepared with a more uh, pragmatic and analytical view of law and, and life. So uh, it's a great achievement that you are all here and I hope that sometime in the near future you come back. Uh, we need good minds, brilliant minds like the ones we have, uh, we have here. Uh, so it's, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here uh, at this uh, Brazil Forum Challenge, Challenges and uh, Perspectives and uh, share some thoughts and some reflections on what's going on in Brazil and what we can do and what we want to do. Uh, the organizers asked me to deliver uh, two talks, one at the opening and another one at the closing. Uh, of course, then I, I hate myself and accepted it. So I, I had to prepare <laughs> two talks in English, uh, um, Sylvia, which is <laughs> uh, when you speak in a different language that's not your own language, you lose uh, the most part of the rhetorical artifices you can use in your own language. And uh, when this happens, uh, you better have some ideas, and uh, <laughs> that's, that's when the trouble starts. Uh, so I divided, since we had uh, two opportunities to be together, I uh, thought that I would first in, in the morning talk about Brazil's institutional moment and make a fairly harsh, I would say, diagnosis of what's currently going on. In, in Brazil. And then at the closing, in our second meeting, I would like to discuss an agenda for the future and looking ahead, not with a short-term view, but thinking ahead, what is the country that we really want to make and build uh, together? A country that's bigger and better uh, than the one we, we, we have right now. Uh, the first thing I thought I, I would do uh, at the outset of, of our conversation is to celebrate some victories that we've had and say a few good things uh, on, a, on a positive note. Uh, and the first thing that occurred to me 
was that when I entered law school, uh, in another life, like <laughs> some few decades ago, let's say that, uh, our main concerns in Brazil, we are in 1976, so our main concerns were how to end torture that still tainted the political scenario in, in Brazil. Uh, another issue was how to end censorship that the military regime imposed, especially on the press. And so the government had the power to decide what we were going to read or what, we, what movies we were going to watch. Uh, very sad times. Uh, our other concern was how to build democratic institutions in a country with such an authoritarian uh, background. So everything at that moment seemed uh, very, very uh, grim, very difficult, very almost impossible to, to achieve. And well, when I look around today and I see that torture is gone, censorship is gone, and we were able to actually build democratic institutions, I do realize that our concerns, our main discussions, have improved. We're now discussing how to end corruption, uh, which is a problem. It has been a problem all the way throughout history. And I think for the first time, we have an actual chance not to abolish it, but to reduce it to a minimum acceptable. We're now discussing how to elevate private and public ethics in, in Brazil. And I think that's a very important discussion. Uh, public ethics is, to a certain extent, a mirror of private ethics. So uh, the solution is not looking outside oneself. It's uh, act, uh, also uh, looking inside and see what, what have I been doing wrong, or as a society, what have we been uh, doing wrong. So we are now discussing how to recapture a good economic and social moment. So what I want to stress here at the outset is how much better our agenda has become uh, when thinking ahead uh, what we want to make of, uh, of Brazil. And the second uh, positive note I want to make uh, before we really start our conversation today is the very important achievements we've had in these 30 years of democracy and of civilian power. And I would like to highlight three of them. First of all is institutional stability. We've had 30 years of democracy in Brazil. And we should not take it for granted because our tradition had always been a tradition of breaches of constitutional legality, a tradition of coup d'etat. So 30 years of democracy is not something that we should disconsider. It's very important. And these have not been easy times. We've had, we have had crises. We have had scandals. We've had many problems. We've had two impeachments. And the Constitution and the institutions are standing. So I don't think we should minimize the importance of this. The second uh, achievement I would like to highlight uh, and stress here in our uh, conversation is monetary stability, an achievement that we obtained during the democratic regime during the past 30 years. Most of you are very young, but those of us who are over 40, uh, a lot beyond 40, <laughs> uh, but everyone who is over 40 uh, in Brazil, I see a couple people that I uh, could point out here, uh, know the horror that it was to live with hyperinflation, inflation of 70% a month, 80% a month. And 
uh, with successive economic plans that en ended up in major failures. Uh, just to mention a Phil Cruzado one, Cruzado two, Dresser, Collar one, Collar two, you name it. So we have also uh, been able to uh, domesticate, let's say, uh, inflation. So monetary stability is a major achievement that we uh, got in these 30 years of democracy. And finally, the third uh, point I would like to highlight here is social inclusion. Uh, in the past 30 years, uh, I know this is a grim moment for the economy, but life is not a picture. Life is a movie, so we, we, we need to see the, the whole movie you know, and all the scenes. We had over 30 million people that left the line of extreme poverty in the past 30 years. And of course, that's a major uh, achievement. That's, that's what countries are for, to make people live better, to make people live with dignity, to make people happier. And I think we were uh, able to, to do this in, in, in the past 30 years. So what I want to say is that we have defeated in this past 30 years, authoritarianism, hyperinflation, and extreme poverty, meaning that nothing is impossible. And I think we've been uh, marching in the right direction, although not at the speed uh, we would like. So uh, these are the good things I, I wanted to say uh, before we started, and just to make sure that I don't sound pessimistic uh, which I'm not. I really think we've been moving forward, and I really think we have a great future. Uh, but unfortunately, there are a few bad things we need to talk about here. But uh, I, I don't want to sound pessimistic. Uh, so I have a friend uh, who was, he is a retired justice, Carlos Aires, and uh, he says about pessimism, this guy went to the doctor and the doctor uh, said to him, I have bad news for you. And I have, uh, besides that, even worse news for you. <laughs> and he goes, well, give me the bad one first. And the doctor says, you only have 24 hours to live. And he goes, oh my god, what could be worse than that? And the doctor says, I've been meaning to tell you this since yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, starting uh, to discuss what uh, are the problems we are facing right now and the paths we can take. Uh, there's no way we wouldn't start by first chapter, combating corruption. And I have an epigraph for each of our chapters, and this one is the following. Corruption favors the worst. It is the prevalence of the clever at the expense of the good. Corrupção significa a vitória dos espertos sobre os bons. And that's very sad, and it shouldn't be that way, uh, of course. What's astounding in Brazil is that we are not talking about particular cases individual flaws. We are talking about an institutionalized uh, corruption that meant that many private companies, many public agents, many political parties, many members of parliament, not a few, many members of parliament, were involved. There was an institutionalized mechanism of distributing money that was taken from the Brazilian people. Money that should have gone to much better things. So the first thing that would strike anyone uh, when we talk about 
uh, corruption in Brazil is the extension and the depth that the problem has gained. And uh, even people who were watching carefully were impressed by the dimension of the problem. <coughs> and of course, everyone is trying to figure why did we get to this point. Uh, I want to say uh, we are in the midst of a car wash uh, operation that is contributing uh, very deeply, I think, to change uh, this matters in, in, in Brazil. But the first, one, first thing I want to say, especially in the law school, is that we should not think that we can change the world with criminal law. We won't. We can change or work with an over-punitive uh, penal law. That, I don't think that's how it works. Uh, we change the world with education. We change the world with fair distribution of wealth. And we change the world with public liberties to discuss the best uh, ways to change things that need to be changed. That being said, uh, however, I think I should say that a absolutely inefficient criminal law, especially when dealing with white collar crimes, is to a certain extent what brought us here. And we created a society in which the rich and powerful thought that they did not to abide by the law, because nothing would ever happen. And the criminal law lost its main purpose in Brazil, which is to function as a general deterrent. People don't do wrong things also because they fear that they can be punished, that something bad can happen to them. And since nothing would happen in Brazil, people were honest or dishonest, whether they wanted or uh, not. And that's the reason why we created a society where the upper class was not embarrassed of being part of fraudulent buildings, active corruption, passive corruption, embezzlement, money laundering, uh, a whole set of crimes that can only be committed by people that are better off and they feared nothing because nothing ever happened to them. So there's something changing in Brazil. There's something going on that I want to stress here. But to be clear, nobody wants a police state, an authoritarian state. We want the right of defense to be respected. We want due process to be respected, uh, of course. But we do not want a system with never-ending appeals, a system where anyone that makes over five minimum wage uh, combined is ever punished. So we don't want a police state. We want a fair state, a fair uh, society. But let me tell you, a state that punishes the interpreter, that bribes, bribes the public servant to win the bid, it's not a police state. It's a fair state. The state that punishes the investor in the financial market that bribes a public agent to get inside information, the state that punishes this person, it's not a police state. It's a fair state. The state that punishes the state-owned pension funds that invest the money of the beneficiaries of the pension fund in investments that are terrible for them just because they uh, got a kickback. 
It's not a police state. It's a fair state. So we are learning uh, the tough way that in a democratic state, you ought to punish people that do wrong things. And to a certain extent, the dictatorship uh, in Brazil left this idea that punishing is always bad. And punishing in the uh, observing due process and proportionally is part of a democratic society. The uh, elite, the Brazilian elite, has great difficulty in punishing people that attend the same banquets as, it, as they do. But this is something we want to change. Every country has an elite, intellectual and economic elite, but it has to be decent. That's one point I, I would uh, like to stress here. Corruption is fostered, I would say, in Brazil and, and anywhere uh, by different causes. I want to mention two of them. First one is the one I've been uh, talking about, impunity. And the second one, in the Brazilian case, is a horrible political system with which we've been struggling for decades, and they just don't change it. But we ought to do it, or we're going to be here 30 years from now discussing the same problems, because the political system is in the origin of most part of the corruption we're going to be discussing here. But just to highlight how difficult it is uh, to punish in, in Brazil, whoever watched the difficulty that the Supreme Court had to enforce criminal convictions after the second instance, whoever watched, and it was a major change, a major shift, indispensable, because otherwise you would never punish anyone that makes more than five minimum wages combined. So that was, but it was six to five at the Supreme Court. Very difficult move, but as I said, it was indispensable to start changing this, curious, this culture of impunity. No matter what I do, nothing will ever happen uh, to me. To uh, stress the difficulty in punishing, if someone watches the difficulty in ending or, or reducing, we're going to talk about this later, uh, the, what we call the privileged forum, uh, it's very difficult because people are just used to not being punished. It's like an acquired right. No matter what I do, nothing will happen to me. What do you, what do you think you're doing? You want to punish me just because I got a few kickbacks or, or some slush money or corrupted some public officials? What do you think? And then they said, not even during the dictatorship, something like this would happen. <laughs> it wouldn't. It wouldn't. So um, we need to uh, face and overcome this misguided tropicalism of the Brazilian elite that cannot punish people that sit at the same table. Uh, and it's, it's more difficult than, than it seems. And this model of impunity has defenders where you would least expect. And they're very powerful. And they're very powerful. Uh, so this is our chapter on uh, combating corruption and impunity. And I'll talk about the political system a little bit uh, later. And I want to say a couple words about this privileged forum, which is in, in, in the debate, uh, because I think that this is a moral issue more than, than a legal issue. In my epigraph here is uh, about the privileged forum and how poorly it works. Power, including the power to judge, must be an instrument of good and justice. 
it cannot be a mechanism for protecting friends and chasing enemies, as many people still think. I have the power. I don't exercise it very well, but I can use it selectively to punish who I don't like and to protect those who I like. That's how the system works. The privileged forum system is made not to work. And it works because you just can't punish anyone, at least not uh, as much as you should, and it takes forever. And if you punish someone eight, 10, 12 years after the facts, that doesn't make much sense. A criminal lawsuit, like lawsuits in general, they should take three months, six months, one year. If it's very difficult, 18 months, that's it. So we just got accustomed to a procedural system where lawsuits last three years, five years, eight years, 10 years, that's ridiculous. So we should not think this is natural because this has become the natural time of duration of a criminal lawsuit in Brazil, of lawsuits uh, in general, I, I think we could say. So uh, one of the causes of impunity, one of them uh, among many, is this privileged forum for a, an American audience. That means that some public agents uh, will not be judged in case of criminal offense by the natural judge that would uh, adjudicate, the, adjudicate the case of any citizen. But there is a special court, either the Supreme Court or the Superior Court of Justice. Uh, I here acknowledge the presence of uh, my good friend, Justice Paulo San Severino. So being uh, judged in criminal cases by a higher court than uh, ordinary citizens, that wouldn't be a problem if the system worked. But as I said, it's made not to work. And, uh, and it, 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 it actually doesn't. Uh, just to give you a few uh, statistics, a few numbers. There were, before the Supreme Court, 500 criminal cases between investigations and criminal procedures uh, already admitted. Now with the Lava Jato uh, plea bargain, with Odebrecht plea bargain, this number will probably rise to 600. Uh, and there are other plea bargains on the way. Uh, most of the cases, if not 100% of the cases, involve members of parliament. So the parliament has 513 deputies and 81 senators. And we're going to have 600 criminal cases against members of, of parliament. That's a lot of people, believe me. Meaning that it was not an accident. It was a way of living and a way of doing business. A way of doing business for the private actors and a way of doing politics for public actors. Uh, it's, it's impossible not to be ashamed of what happened in Brazil. It's just impossible. So uh, we're talking about, at, without counting Odebrecht, plea bargain, 500 cases. The Supreme Court takes about a year and a half to admit a criminal case. Uh, in the privileged forum cases. A first instance judge takes 48 hours. It's just because the procedure before the Supreme Court is so much more complex that it takes much longer. It's not that we don't work. We work a lot, believe me. Uh, but it's made not to work, as I mentioned before. So you have so many faces, uh, so many instances of discussions. And then to 
just admit the beginning of a criminal case. You need to bring a long opinion and discuss it, depending on the authority, with other 10 people in the full court, or with other four people if you are in one of the panels, in one of the tumors. So uh, everything is more complicated, and that's why it takes uh, so long. And third uh, statistic I would like to mention, it's not uncommon, just the opposite, it's very common that statute of limitations apply because we exceed the legal deadlines, including because when the criminal lawsuit started, for example, the defendant was a mayor at some municipality. And then he becomes a deputy, for example. And then the venue, the forum changes from state courts to the Supreme Court. And then uh, he licenses himself from House of Deputies because he's going to run for governor, or if that is the case. And, or he doesn't run for the House of Deputies because he wants to run for, for governor. And then the, 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 the jurisdiction changes again. And if for a certain period of time he has no public mandate, it goes for the first instance. But then if he becomes governor, it doesn't go back to the Supreme Court. It goes to the Superior Court of Justice. And after uh, his term as governor, he runs for, Sen for the Senate. And if he becomes a senator, the case goes to the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court is on the verge of deciding the case, he resigns. And it goes back to the first instance. This is the movie. It's not a joke. It happens all the time. And there are people that are comfortable with this. I mean, of course the defendants are, but I mean, People that should be thinking a better country, they're happy with this. They love it. These are the people that think that rich people should never be punished. As I was saying, we go to the same banquets. So uh, we need to change this privileged forum. You say, well, you have... Uh, 650,000 people in prison in Brazil. And you're talking about 500, 600 uh, cases. So it, it shouldn't impact the system that much. But it does. Because these are the most visible cases. And these are the ones that set the example. And the example of impunity is the worst that you can give. Because if you're doing wrong things at the top and nothing happens, everyone feels more confident to do the same thing. And then you develop a culture that I don't do what I should because nobody does. And then you create a society where anything goes. And for this reason, I am strongly against the Brazilian tradition of settling everything and doing nothing against these people. We're going to change for the future. But let this go by. Because if we don't actually punish these people, we are going to be, again, setting the wrong example. That everything, at the end, will end well, to cite Shakespeare. And the story is going to end with a smile and a quick fix, rather than with the consequences that should have. So I think the, uh, the privileged forum should end through constitutional amendment done by Congress. That would be the ideal. But there is a very easy and plausible constitutional interpretation to restrict it to actions perpetrated when the member of parliament was in its position, in his position or her position as a member of parliament, and acting in his or her official capacity. So if the fact occurred when he was an ordinary citizen or when he was a mayor, 
There's no reason for the case to be adjudicated by the Supreme Court. It just doesn't make any sense. Or if uh, the member of parliament is being prosecuted for something that has nothing to do with his job, with his mandate, like a false representation when selling a private property. Who cares? There's no reason this should go to the Supreme Court. And according to some uh, surveys, this would reduce the cases that are before the Supreme Court uh, dramatically. And that would be a great thing. We don't do well this job. And we should not want to have a competence that we cannot exercise well. So we need to get rid of it uh, as soon as possible, ideally through constitutional amendment. But a judge should never hesitate and do what's right if he has the chance to do uh, what's right in a plausible interpretation of the Constitution and of the statutes that apply. Some people would say, oh, it's not convenient to do this now because we have a crisis. Well, we've been going through this crisis, but if we don't do it, we'll never change the level of public ethics in Brazil. So we should not let short-term concerns be above the need for justice that the Brazilian society fuels this moment. And about the timing, there's a wonderful quote by Martin Luther King that says, it's always, the time is always right to do what's right. So why delay doing what we know we uh, should do? So this is uh, what I would say about the Privilege Forum. Uh, political reform. I'm so tired of speaking about political reform. I've been doing this for so many years. I wrote a proposal of political reform uh, some 12 years ago when I was a, just a constitutional law professor. Uh, no, no one asked me to. I just studied the different systems in the world and made a proposal. And I've been talking about this for the past 12 years, to no avail. I, I feel like uh, there's a, there was a famous Brazilian poet, Carlos Drummond de Andrade, uh, and uh, he went to a, a bookstore that sells used books. Uh, we call sebos in, in Portuguese. I wouldn't know the word in English for this. Uh, and uh, Drummond went to a Cebu, to this uh, bookstore, and there he found a book, his book, a uh, book written by him. And the book had a dedication to a friend. And the friend was still alive. <laughs> Meaning that the friend had gotten rid of his book. <laughs> so he purchased the book and he sends it to his friend and says to John Doe, persistently, insistentemente. <laughs> uh, so here I am talking about political reform once again. I'll be brief. Uh, everyone, that's my epigraph for this, brings with them good and evil. The, civiliz the civilizing, civilizing process exists to potentialize good and to repress evil. So everyone has good and bad within oneself. And civilization means that we repress what's bad and we try to magnify what's good. Well, let me tell you, the Brazilian political system does just the opposite. Uh, and that's why we need to reform it. When you talk about the political system, you're talking about a system of government, presidentialism and parliamentarism. You're talking about the electoral system, uh, which is uh, proportional, majoritarian, or mixed. And you're talking about the party system. We have problems with all of them. Uh, 
And of course, we won't have the time to discuss, and uh, I have like five or ten minutes that I need to, to end. Where is our uh, Bernardo? Is, am I correct? Five or ten minutes that we have left. Uh, so uh, I, I, I have a proposal for the system of government uh, that would attenuate this hyper-presidentialism that we have in Brazil and we have in Latin America that has always been a problem. And I proposed a semi-presidential system like France and, and Portugal for several reasons, but this is not on the table, so we're not going to talk about this at this moment. Uh, so what I uh, would like to discuss is basically the electoral system and, and the party system very briefly. When, when, when you think about a political reform in, in Brazil, the first thing you must notice is the manifest detachment that we have right now between the political class uh, and civil society in Brazil. It's like different worlds. They don't talk to each other. Uh, so that's the problem we need to face. So any political reform in Brazil should have, uh, according to my view, three goals. First one, to reduce the costs of elections, because that's the origin of a good share of corruption. Second, we need to uh, uh, enhance democratic legitimacy. And uh, I'll soon tell you what I mean by that. And third, we need to facilitate uh, the formation of, of majorities, because the fragmentation is part of the problem that we have. So the president should come out of the election with a coalition strong enough to give him support so that he doesn't need to negotiate each important measure, not with the party, but with each individual member of parliament. Each of them with his or her own sometimes legitimate interests or sometimes uh, a big mouth. So we need to have a political reform that can fulfill these three goals. Uh, the main, main problem is in the election for the House of Deputies, where we adopt a model that is proportional with open list. Uh, an American audience might not even understand exactly what this is, but it means that every candidate uh, runs for election in the entire state. Like in Sao Paulo, meaning you can dispute 30 million votes. Uh, the consequence is, first of all, the cost of the campaign. So the uh, proportional system with open list is very expensive. And what it costs to be elected to the House of, Rep of Representatives uh, for the state of Sao Paulo costs more than 10 or 20 times what you can make in the entire four-year period you're going to be in the parliament. So that's one of the causes of corruption. They have to go get this money somewhere else. First problem. Uh, so we need to make things less expensive. Second problem. In the proportional system with open list, uh, the result is that less than 10% of the deputies are elected with their own personal vote. Over 90% are elected with transfer of party vote, or uh, I think it's called pool, pool party, or whatever you, you call it here. So you, you vote for a candidate, but the vote actually goes to the party, and the best voted candidates of the party will get the seat. So we have a system in which only 10% are elected with their own votes. So the electorate, the voters, they do not know exactly who they elected. That's the first problem. Well, the second problem is the candidate 
doesn't know exactly by whom he was elected. So it's a system with no accountability. It can't work. So we have problems with the costs. We have problems with democratic legitimacy. You don't know who your constituents are. Uh, and third place, in the third place, we have this party system that stimulates the multiplication of parties. Parties for hire. Parties with owners. And so politics has become a private business. And then they sell the time in television and the money from the party fund. Well, that goes for the pocket. So that's the system we have. We've been struggling with this for three decades now. Everyone knows it doesn't work. Everyone knows that it fosters dishonesty. But they don't change it. Why would that be? So there are some proposals on the table about ending the possibility of uh, coalitions and creating a, they call it in Portuguese, uh, barrier clause, uh, which possibly a good translation would be a national vote threshold for uh, a party being admitted to representation in, in Congress and getting uh, time on television and, and the party uh, fund. So ending coalitions and uh, establishing a national vote threshold, that's a consensus. Everyone thinks that's right. And the Senate has approved it. But still, nothing happens. And it's very hard when the, the changes you need depend on the people that benefit from the regime you want to change. That's the problem we've been facing for so many years. And uh, also the electoral system, the main idea that's on the table is a German-inspired mixed system that combines the district system, the majoritarian district system, with the proportional system. And then the voter would have two votes, one in his district, and half the parliament would be composed by people elected in the districts, and a second vote in the party. So the second half would be composed uh, of people elected uh, in, in party uh, lists. Uh, the, the last thing I want to say, uh, so that I don't uh, go beyond my time, um, and so I'm going to skip the chapter that was uh, one that's very important, so I'll, I'll leave it for, for later tonight, which is frictions among branches of government and how these relations are uh, going on uh, in, actually, I'll, I'll do this. Instead of saying, of talking about uh, electoral financing, I'll do this later if we have the time. I'll just talk one minute and end and, and here about this friction, because this, especially for an American audience, is something interesting. How the branches of government in Brazil uh, relate to each other in a moment of so intense judicialization that, as Dean Silvia Paulo mentioned at the, the introduction, even the winner of the 1987 soccer championship was decided by the Supreme Court. That's the level of judicialization. Uh, and it was a poor decision, let me tell you. <laughs> I, I got beaten, uh, so that's why I'm complaining here. But basically what I said is we should not in interfere. There, there were procedural issues, so let me defend my, my colleagues that voted uh, for the other side. But uh, of course, there's no point in the Supreme Court overruling the decision of the National Soccer League and say the champion is such and not such. It's, it's such a nonsense. Uh, but judi judicialization has become a major issue in, in, in Brazil, and uh, we could have a whole conference discussing this. But I want to uh, point out the uh, cases in which 
this, uh, these frictions between powers, between branches of government, became very visible. Uh, of course, all this turbulence in Brazilian life, in Brazilian politics, it would have to reach the Supreme Court at one point or another. And it was a very difficult moment for the court because uh, those were issues uh, in which society was divided and passions were all over. Uh, so some of the points uh, that stress these frictions. First, the right of impeachment. Uh, the Supreme Court, with my vote, uh, actually I was the rapporteur, uh, realized that uh, changing uh, the president, actually removing a president in a democratically elect, elected, is very traumatic in any democracy. And if you want to do this, if you need to do this, it needs to follow some predetermined rules. And what was going on was that the Chamber of Deputies was uh, changing the rules uh, along the way just to uh, fulfill interests that were uh, on the table at that moment. And so the Supreme Court stayed the game, voided what had been done, and said, these are the rules. The rules are the same as the ones that were adopted 20 years ago or 30 years ago when other president was impeached. So we, we had president. Let's follow it. And that, that's what we did, and I think we did right. But the majority in Congress and the majority in society uh, were in a hurry to remove the president. That's, that's the truth. And uh, doing the right thing does, as you probably know, means many times telling the majority, you can't do it. There are rights involved. There is a constitution. There is a proper right. And that's what we did. Uh, and so people that were against the government uh, were very upset uh, with us. And then the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate do remove the president. And then the president goes to the court. And then the court says, well, we did interfere with the proceedings, but not with the merits. That's a political issue. So I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. And well, at this point, the opposition uh, and people that supported the president were very upset with the court. So, uh, so let me tell you, this is a job where there's always someone upset with what you've done. <laughs> uh, OK, um, another point of friction, the court removed the Speaker of the House, who is in jail, as you probably know but removed him from being president of the House and from his mandate because he was accused of uh, interfering with a criminal investigation that was going on. Um, but that had never happened before. There was no precedent. It's very difficult to break ground in a political complicated issue like this. And of course, there are tensions when you do this. But I, Again, think we did the right thing. Same with the removal of the president of the Senate from the line of su succession of the president of the Republic because a criminal complaint against him was admitted by the court, complaint for embezzlement. Uh, and, you know, we, we can go on. There was the arrest of a senator. Uh, and now the court uh, has criminal jurisdiction, as I mentioned, over... <coughs> I don't know, 300 or, or 200, I don't know how many, but at least one-third of members of parliament. So we have a system that brings this political tension to the heart of the Supreme Court, which is very bad. These criminal cases should not be before uh, the, the court, as I've been saying. So uh, in this diagnosis, of the current moment in, in Brazil, I uh, had to mention this uh, relationship and sometimes tensions that you have 
uh, among powers and, and range. Let, let me tell you that this is very common in any democracy. This is not exactly a problem. And one funny thing, one of my main uh, subjects of research is judicialization and role of Supreme Courts. And I've been doing extensive writings on this. And the funny thing is, all over the world, all over the world, when uh, you're discussing this matter, people that agree with the decision rendered say, that was great constitutional interpretation. And people that disagree say, they are invading the space of Congress. All over, here, there, and everywhere, that, that's how it, it, uh, it goes. Uh, I uh, need to, to end here, and so uh, we'll leave part of our uh, discussions uh, to our later discussion uh, today. I've uh, spoken of so many things in, in such a short time. Uh, and of course, it's unavoidably superficial when you, when you do that. Uh, that reminds me, Bernardo, of this uh, teacher that uh, asked her students to write a, an essay on uh, religion, sex, and nobility. But in a very brief essay, she wanted to uh, verify their power of synthesis. And this uh, wonderful, brilliant kid wrote, oh my god, that's good, said the princess, still panting. Well, uh, <laughs> the conclusion I want to reach at this uh, first part of our conversation. Uh, again, when I, when I first started college in 1976, uh, I'm saudosista today. When I first started college in 1976, I aligned myself with people that wanted to push the military regime to the margin of history. That was 1976. In 1977, the movement for the amnesty of people that were accused of political uh, crimes, the campaign for the amnesty started, 1977. And then in 1978, the campaign for the convening of a constitution started. Well, the amnesty, in fact, came in 1979, two years after the movement had started. The military regime ended in 1985, nine years after the campaign had started. And the new constitution came in 1988, 10 years after we had started. This means that history sometimes, it moves slowly, and sometimes it moves fast. And it's difficult to predict when it's going to be one way or the other. But our role, I think, as intellectuals, as workers, as interpreters, is just one to push history towards the cause of humanity. Thank you very much.